Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Scott Michael. I am honored to serve as the chair of the tax section, which means I get to interrupt people when they're having a good time. Um, also, I am so honored to serve as chair of the tax section that I got to show off my socks. Good tax section socks. Hope everyone's having a great meeting. The last few days, we've had uh, almost a thousand of our members here, and thousand uh, members and guests in attendance. So thank you all for being here. I'm going to start by thanking our sponsors who made this meeting possible. Uh, our diamond sponsors are the Castellanitz firm, Castellanitz, Schartz's Fries, LLP, and Tax Notes. Thank you very much to our diamond sponsors. Our Ruby sponsors are Aon, Asbury Law Firm, Blue Jay, Kaplan and Drysdale, Kroll LLP, Dentons, Hockman, Salk, and Tosher Perez PC, Morgan Lewis, Nelson Mullins, Northwestern Pritzker School of Law Tax Program, Synergy, Taylor Nelson, Emitrano LLP, and VRC. Thank you very much to our Ruby sponsors. I also want to recognize Thomson Reuters and the educational affiliate of the tax lawyer, the Northwestern Graduate Tax Program, hail to purple, hail to white, for their long-term support of the section, including their sponsorship of this year's Careers in Tax Dinner for law students and LSTC participants. I'm very proud that we started this meeting on Thursday afternoon with the Pro Bono Clinic here in San Francisco organized by the Pro Bono and Tax Clinics Committee in collaboration with the LITCs in the Bay Area and hosted by Morgan Lewis and Bacchius LLP. We had around 25 volunteers who assisted 16 taxpayers with their issues. It was such a meaningful way for us and our colleagues to connect and to give back to our host community for this conference. If you are interested in pro bono, I encourage you to register for our virtual settlement week, April 3rd through April 5th, and to download the Center for Taxpayer Rights LITC Connect tool, which matches volunteers with pro bono opportunities. I'm especially excited at this meeting that we successfully launched our Live Well, Lawyer Well initiative. And I want to thank Les Book, Sonia Shake, and Melissa Wiley for leading a great discussion on Thursday afternoon. We had over 50 of our section participants in the room talking about dealing with the stress in our professional lives and how to find balance between our personal and professional lives. Also want to thank Mike Desmond and Megan Brackney for leading an enthusiastic group run yesterday morning through the streets of San Francisco. And also to our Women in Tax Forum, for holding a hearty group walk yesterday and discussion. It was raining, and so if you saw some of us doing the loop on the level below us here four or five times, that's, that was us for our Live Well, Lawyer Well walk. Next, I'm going to recognize our uh, committee leaders, our speakers, and our leadership council for their tremendous work in putting together terrific CLE panels, business meetings, and network events. I always say the tax section would be nothing, it would be nothing without the generosity and the commitment of our, of our leaders and our members. And so please, if you are a committee leader, a, a chair or a vice chair, or if you're in council, or if you're an officer of the section, stand up and let us all recognize you. Thank you all. And finally, I want to take a moment to thank our tax section staff for all of their hard work and dedication. We so appreciate everything they do to make this meeting and all of our section activities and initiatives happen and happen so well. I'm so very, very grateful for them. And I'm thrilled that our new section director, Betsy Roach, is here with us today 
for her first tax section meeting. She's an experienced and an insightful association professional, and we are fortunate to have her leading the staff at this time. So I'd like our staff to please stand, and we can all give you a well-deserved round of applause for your work. In the back. Yesterday, we held our Law Student Tax Challenge, our moot court competition for JD and LLM students, which showcases the next generation of tax law. I hope everyone had the privilege, everyone who had the privilege to judge or observe the oral arguments and watch these future lawyers, and hopefully future tax lawyers, witness their incredible efforts in both the prior written competition and to prepare their arguments for this round. Congratulations to, in the LLM division, the best written presentation and the first place winners, Joaquim Saldaha and Norma Chayo Dichi from the Georgetown University Law Center. And to the... <laughs> and into the JD division, to the first place winners, Natalie Romano Nush and Victor Ficara from Temple University Beasley School of Law. And the JD Best Written winners were Brendan Morrison and Joy Vincenzo from Western New England University School of Law. So now I want to move to our, some of our fellowship programs. First, we are just thrilled to have two classes of Loretta Collins Argret Fellows here in San Francisco. We'd like to welcome and recognize the second class of Argret Fellows in their first in-person meeting. So if we have any Argret Fellows in the audience, give a wave. Let us give you an appropriate recognition. I, I encourage you to consider applying to the Argret Fellowship and perhaps more so to help spread the word about the application period for the next class of this important Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Fellowship. Applications are due June 30th and can be found on the section website. Second, I would like to recognize our current Christine Brunswick Public Service Fellows who work in low-income tax clinics for two years providing valuable legal assistance to vulnerable taxpayers. If Muhit or Hannah are here, are you here, anybody? Wait, there we go, there's Hannah. Thank you very much. These fellowships are for recent law school graduates working in nonprofit organizations focusing on public interest tax law for two years and are funded through the section's Tax Assistance Public Service Endowment Fund, or TAPS. And we, we always encourage our members and others to make donations to our TAPS endowment and to our JEDI endowment. If you do, you get a snazzy little ribbon on the bottom of your badge and you help, import, you help support important section causes. In November, we were thrilled to welcome our Tax Analyst Public Service Fellow, Leslie McLean. Is Leslie here? Yeah, Leslie. <laughs> this fellowship is modeled on the Brunswick Fellowship, but is for more experienced tax attorneys and is funded entirely through a generous contribution by tax analysts, for which we are very grateful. Through the fellowship, Leslie is relaunching the LITC at the DNA People's Legal Services, which serves portions of Navajo and Apache countries, including the Navajo and Hopi nations, seven tribal nations in total. The application for the next Tax Analyst Public Service Fellow is open, and applications uh, will be reviewed on a rolling basis starting on April the 1st. And finally, I'm gonna welcome the 2023-2024 class of John S. Nolan Fellows, are our Nolan Fellows here? So, give a wave. <laughs> Nolan Fellows are tax lawyers who are actively involved in the section and have demonstrated leadership qualities and a commitment to the section's mission. The nomination period for the next class of Nolan Fellows will be released shortly, so keep an eye out for that. And finally, before I turn it over to our plenary panel, I want to welcome Julie, De Julie Davola, our esteemed former 
section chair, a good friend of mine, and a chair, the chair of this year's nominating committee to the podium to announce the slate for the 2024-2025 Tax Section Leadership Council. Julie? Thanks so much, Scott, who has been a fantastic leader so far. And um, thanks to everybody who's here. Uh, I'm, the nominating committee met in January, and we had a lot of work to do. You'll see that we had a lot of slots to fill, and you'll see that they did some absolutely amazing work. Um, you can see on the screen the, um, <coughs> the full slate, but uh, first, Chair elect is uh, Megan Brackney. <laughs> do we usually make people stand up? Or do we usually make people stand up? I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Megan, I'm going to make you stand. <laughs> All right. Uh, Vice Chair of Committee Operations, Kathy Fung. People don't have to stand up, but I would love it if you did. Okay, you do. All right. <laughs> Vice Chair of Administration, George Hanney. <laughs> Vice Chair of Government Relations, Michael Desmond. <laughs> Vice Chair of Publications, Les Book. <laughs> and then we have five new regular council directors. We have what? Oh my God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Last but not least, <laughs> Vice Chair of Membership Diversity and Inclusion, Melissa Wiley. <laughs> Can't believe I left her out. All right. <laughs> um, so next, Council Directors. Uh, we have Matt Cooper. And I want you, you folks to stand up, too, if you're here. Catherine Kennedy. Kim Major. Ellen McElroy. And Joshua Odins. And then if that wasn't enough, we had a special slot to fill um, because Scott Levine had been on council, as you all probably know. He was uh, <clears throat> picked to be a top OECD negotiator for Treasury. And so um, his, special, his slot, because he had to resign from council, has been filled by Bela Unel. So uh, that's the report of the nominating committee. I think you'll agree with me that they did tremendous work. Thank you very much, Julie. It, it, being on the nominating committee uh, uh, and serving as the chair of the nominating committee is such an important part of what we do as a section to ensure that our leadership follows and, and, and pursues the missions and initiatives of our section. On, a, on, on you know, from here in, until eternity. So thank you, Julie, for all of the hard work that you put into it and to the staff for the work that they did and for all of the members of the nominating committee for the work that they did. Um, I was amused when, when you let Melissa out, like Caroline was going, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Sorry. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's panel discussion, Travis Thompson. Travis is with Seidman and Bancroft here in San Francisco, and he serves as the chair of our Tax Practice and Technology Committee. He will introduce the uh, distinguished panel for our plenary session. And I want to thank Travis for all of his hard work with the section. He's really revitalized this committee. If you've attended any of their sessions in the past uh, three or four meetings, they've just been extraordinary, uh, and uh, you're doing a great job. Thank you so much. So please come up and uh, take over the panel. Yeah. 
Thank you, Scott. And uh, how about another round of applause for the tax section staff? Yeah. Right? Thank you so much for everything you guys do. You've been absolutely great. The meeting's been great. Um, my name is Travis Thompson. I am the chair of the Tax Practice and Technology Committee, formerly the Tax Practice Management Committee. And I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our speakers today for the plenary luncheon. So directly to my left is Ben Allery. Uh, ben is a professor at the University of Toronto School of Law. He's also uh, the CEO of Blue Jay Legal, uh, who is one of the foremost companies in tax and legal research uh, in the world. Uh, Ben's most recent book is called The Link Legal Singularity, How Artificial Intelligence Can Make Law Radically Better. So, Ben, thank you for being here. Thanks, Travis. Uh, Jonathan Choi, to his direct left, is, oh, I'm sorry, Jonathan Choi at the end, mm -hmm. professor at USC School of Law, right? Jonathan actually specializes in law and artificial intelligence, uh, including tax law. Uh, his work has been in many law reviews, including Yale and Stanford and NYU, and you know most of his work is debated and talked about on all major news networks. So thank you, Jonathan, for being here. And finally, uh, my friend and vice chair of the Tax Practice Technology Committee, Caitlin Tharp. Caitlin is an attorney at Steptoe uh, in Washington, D.C., and we travel the United States together talking about artificial and intelligence and tax, and we're just very grateful that she's here. So thank you, Caitlin. Thanks. In the early 1960s, Professor Thomas Kuhn, uh, in his famous work, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, coined a term that I'm sure we're all familiar with now called the paradigm shift. And at the time, he was trying to talk about how scientific thought radically changes, not over time, but with revolutionary moments in science. And he was trying to explain really what Einstein brought to scientific thought after New Newtonian physics had existed for hundreds of years. That term paradigm shift has taken on new meaning over the decades, and we use it often uh, when we talk about many things. But we often use it when we're talking about still revolutionary changes, right, in either uh, work or uh, scientific thought or academics. And so today, our panel is going to discuss the paradigm shift, if you will, of artificial intelligence and the law and taxation. And so to get us started, uh, I'd like to pose a question to Ben. And it's a question that's on the minds of many tax accountants and a lot of tax lawyers. So Ben, are, are, is AI and robots going to replace us? <laughs> <clears throat> well, I wish it had an easy answer to this one, Travis, but the basic answer, as I, as I see it, is not immediately. Uh, um, I mean, if you, if, if you look at what's being developed now, we're really talking about tools that can allow you to, to get to, uh, you know, a starting point in your tax analysis very, very quickly, and a, a very good starting point. And what we're gonna witness over the coming years, a series of measurable improvements in this technology. So we're here today, we'll be here next year, we'll be you know, at these conferences over the next five, eight, 10 years. Every year, there will be measurable improvements in the technology, and this same question is gonna come up at every meeting and everyone will say, well, it's not quite there yet, but you know, these tools are really useful. I think by 10 years from now, it'll be utterly inconceivable that you would be practicing tax without using these kinds of technological supports, but people are still gonna be practicing tax. Now, once you get out beyond 10 years, 15 years from now, I, I don't know, all, all bets are off, um, I'm not sure, but I, I do know um, you know, to, to get back to this paradigm shift, at some point things will change and, and we're likely to approach you know, what I've labeled in, in some of my academic work, the legal singularity, and things will be utterly unrecognizable, but I think that's some time away yet. Can you describe that? What is the legal singularity? So I think the, 
one way of thinking about it is um, the complete practical elimination of legal uncertainty. So think about leveraging technology to, to basically achieve universal legal literacy. Anybody can access any legal insight immediately. Um, and you might say, well, Ben, how is that possible because the law isn't fully specified? We don't, we don't have an answer to every legal question. There are lots of gaps in the law. Just like you know, first year law students learn that all contracts are incomplete and they're inescapably incomplete because we can't actually stipulate you know, what happens in any given future contingency. I think we'll get to a point where the law is able to, these systems supporting the law are able to generate answers to any conceivable contingency. So you can ask, pose a question, a hypothetical, and our legal system will generate an answer to that. Uh, and so this will be, it won't be complete certainty. It won't, it's not like law is gonna be solved, but for practical purposes, you'll be able to generate uh, a legal answer in real time and on demand. Jonathan, if artificial intelligence was always designed to make humans more efficient, I mean, are, are they really gonna replace us professionals? There are a lot of things that human professionals do that AI is currently not capable of doing, and that in fact, I think, you would require significant scientific innovation to imagine AI being capable of doing it. So a fundamental limitation of these large language models, for example, is that they're best at what is in their training set. And the training set is documents. There's a lot of legal language in the documents, but there's not a lot of, say, talking to clients, making tough decisions, practical reason. That's one of the reasons why large language models are really good at, for example, composing poetry, but they're surprisingly bad at common sense, because there's not a lot of common sense in <laughs> in books and the things that they're trained on. So I think there are a lot of fundamental limitations in actually trying to entirely replace a human of almost any kind in almost any job that matters with a robot. But between total uselessness and complete replacement, there's a huge space. And I think, like Ben is saying, we're already at a place where it's very uh, efficiency improving, productivity increasing to be able to leverage these tools. Now, Caitlin, we've We've talked about this a lot, and so as a tax practitioner in the United States, uh, how are you thinking about this? Do you feel you know, as though your job is in jeopardy? No, um, I would say that as a practitioner, I think that one of the like, most important values uh, that we have is in our judgment, and, and that's something that we have as human beings. Um, AI, generative AI doesn't have that judgment. So it's, as a large language learning model, it's able to uh, distill a whole bunch of data and uh, come to an answer on things that are known. But many of the questions that we're asked are the unknowns and trying to analogize uh, something that seems similar and then put it to, to new facts or, or new legal circumstances. So I, things will change in the future gradually, but um, I think that will still be a valuable part of the legal decisions and community. I want to talk about just institutions, uh, particularly academic institutions. Uh, Professor Choi, I mean, obviously a lot of rapid development in the world of AI right now, right? So, you know, how should tax institutions, accounting firms, law firms, academic institutions, how, sh how should they begin to adapt, right, to, the, to this new environment? Well, of course, academic institutions aren't famous for rapidly adapting to anything. <laughs> um, and I think we've seen a lot of interest in the opportunities and the challenges presented by AI, and that's even in traditionally conservative institutions like, like universities. And so increasingly, there are classes, I'm teaching a class this spring, that tries to teach students how to use AI effectively in legal research and writing and use it to supplement their thinking. There's also a big challenge though, um, and this is something people have said about legal technology for ages, but there's a, a challenge that if you become dependent on these technologies, you may never learn how to, for example, draft an effective brief from scratch, do legal research from scratch, and then you lose something in creativity and the ability to make really effective arguments. So that's a risk. And for law schools, the way that I've seen folks balance it so far is that you teach basic, say, first year courses without AI assistance, and then before you graduate, you, you learn how to use the tools as well. And I think there are analogs to that in the law firm setting as well, that you need to learn how to draft a contract from scratch, 
before you can just rely on an AI to draft contracts for you and never really engage with the deep questions. So are you saying we're all going to be victim to like the spell check conundrum where we mm -hmm. don't have dictionaries on our desk anymore and we found the utility of spell check to outweigh uh, you know, the need to be able to spell correctly when we're being lawyers? Right, I mean, that's a good example. I think people are probably worse at spelling now, but maybe that doesn't matter. Um, so the question is, it's, uh, and there are lots of legal tasks like this, like e-discovery is making it so that people don't have to read these mountains of documents anymore. Maybe you learned something from conducting discovery by hand, but probably not enough to justify the years spent on discovery. So um, how much do you learn from drafting documents from scratch? Maybe it's enough that you should do it a few times. Maybe it's not enough that you should be doing it from scratch forever. Ben? I, 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 this is so interesting. I find this so curious because you know, when, I, when I think about learning, I think about feedback. right? So as a human, if you're trying to master some new, some new skill, um, why, why, do, why do people like video games so much? You get immediate feedback on what you're trying in the game. If you're trying to master the game of chess, you know, I would argue that chess software and um, these automated evaluation engines that'll tell you the strength of different moves actually accelerates your learning of a game like chess. Um, so I, I'm actually really curious about um, you know this idea that oh we should take first year law students and you know teach them contract law and get them to write contracts from scratch. Um, and I don't know, I guess manually, this, maybe this is like a, 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 you know, a jobs initiative for law professors. We, we need to manually give them feedback on the contract that they're drafted, drafting. Maybe, or maybe there's a role for AI to accelerate that feedback. So as you're putting together a clause, it'd be like, oh, you could do it that way, but you might consider changing you know, the wording this way, that way. I, I see a role for AI accelerating learning of all different kinds of skills, including legal skills. And so I think we can harness the technology uh, to assist uh, with that as well. And you know, returning to the chess analogy for just a second, I think we've seen um, extraordinarily talented young people become you know, unprecedentedly good at the game of chess by leveraging software and, and you know, using adaptively uh, more challenging technology to improve their chess game. I don't know why it would be different necessarily for people learning to become lawyers, tax lawyers. Um, you know, the tax lawyers of the future may very well become unrecognizably good from the perspective of where we are today leveraging these kinds of technologies to improve their capabilities. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm just not sure. I think feedback is, is the way that we tend to learn things. And so I think you know, I can imagine leveraging feedback, um, technological feedback. I totally agree, by the way. There's a separate question between whether instructors should provide feedback with the assistance of AI and whether the students should be using AI um, for feedback. If law professors were to do that, that would be wonderful. Uh, whether law professors have the competency to start using AI for feedback is another question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I agree with that, too. <laughs> Caitlin, we were, outside we were talking about when we learned how to do legal research in law school, right? And so. You know, you have a pretty good grasp on you know the products that are out there now. How do you think law school uh, legal research or even tax research is going to change at the academic institution? You know, when teaching it to the students. And then Ben, I'd love to get your take on that too. Yeah, no, I think it's important for law students to be learning how to use AI, how to use the tools that will most help them in practice. And you know, so back, we, we, the legal profession has gone through various technological changes. Um, you know, people used to use the reporters to go find a case, and you know, now we all agree that it's better to search an electronic database. Um, so these advances, once we have like very helpful generative AI um, legal research programs, that you know, if you're able to ask a question uh, for AI, um, to find your, your research, uh, that's a lot more helpful than you know, trying to figure out the Boolean searches. You're, you'll be able to get more um, you know, responsive and directed answers to the, the questions that you are looking into. Ben, we, about a year ago, we, when chat GPT was blowing up, mm -hmm. right? you and I talked about how your academic institution 
was taking a different road with ChatGPT and generative AI for your students. Um, more of uh, an embracing the technology, right? I, I'm hoping you can talk to the room a little bit about that, why you chose uh, to embrace generative AI at the, within the uh, law school, and what would that teach, or how can that teach you know, other types of tax firms and accounting firms on how to approach it? Yeah, totally interesting. And I'll speak just for myself as a faculty member. Not all my colleagues actually agree with this embracing approach to, to ChatGPT. Um, I ran an experiment last year. Uh, in January, I approached the dean and said, Dean Brunet, I have to tell you, uh, I intend to allow all of my law students in my three classes this semester full open use of whatever AI they want to use to, to write their uh, comment papers and advance a class and to write their final term papers and to even write their final exam in my tax class. I'm like, I'm, they're going to be able to use the internet. They can use whatever technology they want to use. And, Dean Brené said, Ben, are you really sure you want to do this? I'm like, yeah, I, I want to see what happens. So I was really curious about uh, this experiment. I had colleagues who looked at me aghast in the hallways and said, Ben, like, you're allowing your students to, to engage in academic offenses. This is plagiarism. Like, it's not plagiarism if I'm like, this is part of like, their academic assignment is to use AI and to figure out how they can use it to improve their academic work product. It was very interesting when I graded uh, the final term papers, for example, um, something was different in the term papers. The very best papers were as creative and original and insightful as they ever been in the past, kind of indistinguishable from uh, the past. Um, and then they were in a distribution, but what's really interesting is the bottom 10 to 15% of those assignments were indistinguishable from kind of the median assignment submitted which I found totally fascinating. There was no longer this rump of papers that like obviously people left it to the last minute or people left it to the last weekend um, and they rushed their papers. And even if people did that, it produced a work product that was like reasonably good. It was like, it was actually like successfully hiding in the pack mm. of law student papers, which I found really, really um, interesting. So this year, I. I on the, on the exams, on the other hand, it was a different story. Um, it was all over the shop, and, and some students relied on um, technology way too much on the final exam and produced, you know, ghastly uh, <laughs> answers. Um, but um, this year, the three-hour final exams, no AI is allowed in, in my tax class this year. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to still run this experiment, um, continue on with it for writing the term papers because I think it is a really good exercise to see what are the limitations of the technology. How can it actually help me produce a better work product? And it's not improving the high-end uh, work products. Maybe it's accelerating the production of those papers. Maybe it's making it a little bit more fun to write these papers and having ideating conversations with uh, with different AI systems. I think that's probably true. Um, students like it a lot, and I think it, it can revitalize the writing process rather than looking at that blinking cursor and feeling that sense of anxiety and writer's block. They can just ask a question and, and start having an interaction with the system that may prompt um, additional thinking. So um, it's very interesting. I think there, there's a full range of attitudes about this technology in higher education. Um, the colleagues who a year ago thought it was plagiarism still think it's plagiarism. Um, and uh, folks like me have, have maybe you know, developed more nuanced views about its place. Uh, but it's, it's very exciting. It's very interesting. Professor Troy, what makes you know, staying with generative AI, what makes it so special? It's much more capable than the natural language processing tools that we had even a few years ago. So there have been huge scientific developments um, since then. It has the capacity to reason in a way that our natural language processing tools didn't a few years ago. So it, it just works better. It's more human-like. Um, it has the ability to collect sources, summarize with a relatively high degree of accuracy. Uh, and I think it's the performance of the models that has really made them more promising for practical applications like BlueJay. The fact that they can be accurate enough that they're really worth going to the search box waiting for the result. Caitlin, you and I have been talking a lot about the ethics 
of the use of generative AI around the United States. How, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if you could describe to the audience some of the, you know, some of the topics around ethics and the use of generative AI that we've covered and why it's so important from a ABA, you know, professional responsibility standpoint or your respective bar professional responsibility, um, you know, rules. Right. So the, the, there are professional obligations and then there's, you know, broader senses of ethics. So when Ben was discussing is uh, using generative AI plagiarism, that, that's a question of, well, uh, us as practitioners, uh, what is it to create work product? Um, you know, does it have to be all originally written by you or someone at your firm? We all use templates, so that's you know, something that evolves. Um, also, with ethics, there's a the question of bias in using generative AI because you know the outputs it creates are only going to be as good as the information that it is trained on. So, if there is bias in how it's trained or the information it takes in, that will be spat back out. Um, in the outputs. So going to the uh, professional uh, uh, rules of governing our conduct as attorneys, uh, I mean, there's a few things. Um, you know, start first with a competence that you need to be using generative AI competently so that you're, you know, if you are getting a hallucination uh, from generative AI that it's, you know, made up a case that you're not just putting that into a court filing as we've heard various attorneys have had uh, issues with. Um, also with competence, there's a need to like, understand how to use these new technologies. So we know that it's, it's part of our duties to uh, understand how to use e-discovery and uh, to comply with e-discovery obligations. And keeping abreast of technology will be something that um, will encompass using AI if that's going to be uh, more helpful in practice or just how to use it properly. Um, going further through the ethical rules, there's concerns about confidentiality. If you're in an open source so like ChatGPT, that the information you put in, um, what is ChatGPT going to do with it? If it's going to learn from um, the information you put in because it is a, a learning language model and learns off the prompts it's given. Uh, so th that's a concern that, that's less present in a closed system that's not learning. Um, and then, then finally, there's going to be the like, supervisory uh, issues of um, are the attorneys that you super supervise using generative AI and how are they using it? And uh, you know, try to understand that you know, generative AI is not just being relied on solely, but that um, if there's the chance for hallucinations or um, you know, misstatements that um, someone is, is, you're using your judgment as an attorney to ensure that, that like, this is correct and is you know, actually supporting the statements that you want to be making. So there's going to be a lot of uh, ethical uh, duties that arise from the use of generative AI. All right, so let me try to understand this. Unlike the attorney in New York, I should not ask ChatGPT to write any of my court submissions for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, certainly you don't want uh, ChatGPT writing entire submissions. Um, I mean, with the, the confidentiality issue, you've probably already put all sorts of uh, uh, client attorney privilege facts into ChatGPT. Uh, but more than that, uh, yes, uh, generative AI does hallucinate because it's a um, language learning model. It's, it's predictive. It's not uh, always a research database. We're, we're not at that stage yet. So uh, you know, ChatGPT is going to try to predict or create an answer if it doesn't see one. So uh, if you're going to go and ask it, uh, what are the major uh, tax cases discussing the presumption of correctness? I can get two uh, right answers that are actual cases and then two uh, hallucinated made up cases. And so you need to be able to uh, distinguish those things and then not be um, putting them in a court filing, which you, know, you need to be ensuring the accuracy of the statements you make to the, to the court. So. Um, it, just you, the duties that you have regularly. Now, Ben, we've talked a lot about ChatGPT, and that's, I mean, it's like the use of Xerox, right, when we're talking about generative AI as far as marketing goes, but 
Generative AI, it, you know, there's many applications, many companies that are, you know, designing their own generative AI. Why, why is it different to do legal research uh, with, you know, like a, a platform like Blue Jay or another company and Thomson Reuters um, or whoever, Lexus? Why is that different uh, from a generative AI standpoint than, say, just asking Chat GPT? Yeah, I, I think. The big difference is um, generative AI solutions um, can take many different forms, right? So if you're thinking about um, something specifically designed with the use cases of, of, of a tax lawyer in mind, who, whomever is bringing that tax generative AI solution to market will be familiar with the use cases of that generative AI um, solution for the kinds of problems that tax lawyers, for example, are seeking to solve. And um, one of the things that, that is really important that we see in, in a number of these platforms, including uh, in BlueJay, is overcoming the, some of the, the problems with ChatGPT. So um, Caitlin mentioned hallucinations. That's a significant one. Uh, another one is linked to you know, your question about the, the New York attorney who relied solely on ChatGPT. So it's hallucinating, but you know, even if you have a hallucinated answer, it's still possible to verify whether or not those sources exist. And you don't ask the same source that hallucinated the, the, <laughs> those sources whether or not this is in fact a real case. Like you cross-reference with something more authoritative. And so we see the, the specific solutions. For example, Blue Jay um, just announced on Thursday a, a new uh, arrangement with tax notes where all the tax notes materials are gonna be fed into Blue Jay and relied on to produce answers uh, in the Ask Blue Jay solution. So, basing the solution on like the code, the regs, PLRs, rev rulings, rev procs, this is something that you know a more generalized solution isn't doing. Based it on expert commentary, like from tax notes. Mm -hmm. So, if you're using a system specifically designed for a tax research use case, it's going to be linking the answer to these verifiable sources, and you can click through and pull out those verifiable sources directly from that result screen. And so you can address the hallucination point just in line. You've got those authoritative resources right there. You can go and click, and it's designed to make it easy to verify the information. It's designed to be very current, right? So this is the other limitation of um, these other systems that are more general, like they scrape the internet periodically, and and then produce answers. Um, so many of you who have used ChatGPT, I'm actually really curious. How many of you have used ChatGPT? Okay, roughly like roughly half of you are responding. Um, so this is kind of like <laughs> this kind of like law students. I don't know. Um, how many of you have not used ChatGPT? Okay, so the, you know you're all paying attention. This is good. Um, so it's roughly 50/50. So there's no right way or wrong way. Um, but if you have been, if you're among the half who have been using it, um, you'll probably encounter the situation where it says, well, as a large language model, I, you know, I'm only trained up until, I guess it's now April 2023, my most recent information. Well, that's not gonna cut it for a tax research use case, because you want, like, what's actually happened up until, like, today? <laughs> I need to know what the current stuff is. And so that's another way that these um, solutions that are coming to market are gonna be able to address the, the needs of people wanting to rely on it for tax research. So it's currency, it's overcoming hallucinations by grounding it in real materials, and then putting those materials at your fingertips so you can verify it right there uh, and make sure that it's, it's based on the right stuff. Professor Choi, I see you thinking over there. What's your take on the use of chat GPT versus other kind of closed systems? So I completely agree with what Caitlin and Ben have been saying. But I think a lot of the shortcomings with ChatGPT are problems that some of our brightest minds are trying to solve, and in some cases uh, have, have already solved. So um, the problem with confidentiality and not having your information be used in future training runs, ChatGPT now has an option not to include your information in future training runs. The problem with currency, uh, ChatGPT has like a plugin that will look at the internet and see if updated sources have come to light. The problem with hallucinations, these are regarded as the biggest problems with LLMs today, and they're things that people are always trying to solve. So 
I think in, even in a matter of months and you know, one or two years, a lot of the biggest issues uh, will be largely ameliorated. You know, GPT-4 hallucinates a lot less than GPT-3.5, which is the platform that was used by that lawyer with the, the made-up sources. GPT-5 will presumably hallucinate even less than GPT-4. Um, that said, if you have a solution that grounds in self and real sources, like BlueJay, that already almost never hallucinates, is my understanding. Um, so there are technological workarounds that we have today. There are more general technological improvements that companies like OpenAI, Anthropic, Google are already making. And I think we'll see a lot of improvement along uh, the lines of the big problems that we've been discussing. Mm -hmm. Now, my law firm was answering an RFP this week, right? And it came on the heels of me warning a group of CPAs in New York City last week that our more sophisticated clients are going to start to ask us questions about how we're using this technology and how they can directly find the impact either in their invoices or in the legal work that's being provided. And so our law firm was answering an RFP this week that specifically asked that question. How are you utilizing artificial intelligence and digitalization in your legal services? And how can we look at and find ways that you are transferring those cost savings to us? So along the same lines as what we've been talking about, how do you see uh, legal services, Professor Choi, the nature of legal services changing uh, inside of accounting firms and law firms? Are, do you think that there are problems with the economics, the future of the economics of the practices of these? How are they supposed to adapt, uh, given that we can get to answers quicker and more efficiently? Oh, there are so many interesting issues there. I mean, one is the nature of billing. Um, and so people worry that billable hours are not well suited to a world where you can get a lot of leverage, no longer from, say, associates at a firm, but from the use of AI. And if a lot of the value that has actually been billed for has, you know, even before the advent of high performance artificial intelligence has really been from the judgment of the partners and not necessarily from the time you spend in due diligence or rediscovery or you know, writing research memos. Um, maybe we need to more directly assign the value to the, the sources of value in our billing practices. And so maybe billing practices need to change. The kinds of worries that I've heard about from law firms and the kinds of things that general counsel that I've talked to have been very interested in have been not sending questions out to law firms in the first place. Because now, the problem before was that the general counsel didn't have the manpower to answer very research intensive questions, for example, in-house. Now with AI leverage, maybe they can answer those questions in-house. Maybe some of the questions that they would have sent outside um, dry up. However, you know, we live in a dynamic economy. Maybe if law firms themselves use AI, the cost of legal services will become cheaper. And now there are issues that would have been too expensive to send out to law firms before that are now economical to send out to law firms. So there's a question of induced demand, as the economists call it. It's not clear that when you have increases in productivity from AI or anything else, that the amount of labor supply Oh, sorry, labor demand will decrease. It could be that there will be more humans than ever because each human produces much more output with the assistance of AI. That means that the humans themselves are more economically valuable. Um, an analogy I draw sometimes is to accounting firms. So in, in the 80s, when Microsoft Excel started to become more popular, people were worried that, you know, if, oh, accountants, this is not really what accountants ever did, but if accountants are spending all their time balancing spreadsheets and we now have spreadsheet software, um, maybe accounting jobs will dry up. And that hasn't been the case. We have four times more accountants now than we had then. Uh, there is, if anything, undersupply of accountants, like accounting firms can't find enough warm bodies to fill the seats. So there are many ways in which new technology that increases productivity will be complementary to the kinds of services that lawyers provide. And that, I think, is what we've seen so far. Caitlin, I'm wondering, are, are you having these conversations at your law firm or with, with colleagues about, about this technology? And, and what are those conversations like, if so? Well, um, 
You know, it, interesting point you brought up earlier about um, first the concerns about using generative AI would be that oh, clients are not going to want us to use it, and you know the, we'll need to disclose using generative AI as if as if it's a bad thing that we need to be telling them. And then you move over to the other side of clients wanting the use of generative AI because it is that that time saver. Um, and because, you know, why would you be paying for an associate to do research for so many hours when generative AI can find an answer much quicker? So, um, I mean, it's an interesting thing to uh, work on implementing it. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sure you're all aware that the legal profession isn't exactly the uh, quickest in, in change and adopting new technologies. But we, we sort of get embedded in the way that we do things, and we think that's the, the way that we should do them because they've, they've been very effective. But there are certainly ways that we can improve, and, you know, these new technologies are, are one of those, you know, things that we should be tapping into. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, just a couple observations kind of tying uh, uh, some of the things that, that each of you have said together. One is, um, it's very likely that the firms are gonna really struggle to, to you know, avoid the billable hour. Like I think the billable hour, so you, you know, there's talk about maybe changing billing practice. I think that's it's gonna be very difficult, but in step with increases in productivity, it could be that billable hour rates go up Right, because you know, for every unit of time spent, an attorney is able to deliver that much more value. So there's still utility in you know measuring, meeting out, kind of like how much work did we actually get done for the client by increasing billable hourly rates. So that's a possibility. Another thing is a lot of clients push back now very strongly against um, research time that's spent on different files. And so there's a like my understanding is there there's a lot of unbillable research time or billable, otherwise billable time that gets written off um, by a lot of firms for research. So these tools can help mitigate um, you know, that non-recoverable time that's already spent and that's time that can then, then be redeployed for, for other work. So um, let's ask the audience, who writes off time for legal research in the audience? All right, well, see, some. Yeah. I mean, I know we do, Yeah. right? And I wanted to get to that point I talk about it, and I, I use the term capturing real time, right? Which is to say that now that you know legal research has become more efficient, we can bill real time to clients that's actually, you know, they actually pay for, right? Versus taking much longer on a research project without the technology, and then having to write off some of that legal research time. And so, what you're saying, if I hear it correctly, is this technology may be a, a revenue generator for institutions like law firms and accounting firms. Right, because all, all, all that written off time it has an opportunity cost. That, that individual could be working on stuff that's actually going to be billable and recoverable, for sure. And they could do other things, right? like you know, make their briefs better, mm -hmm. right? or you know, do extended legal research on it because it's going to be quicker and more efficient. Right? They could do other legal tasks or accounting tasks. When we use the word efficiency, I think we we think about in terms of whatever we're producing in the moment, but there are these other ancillary tasks that we do as professionals that are not necessarily, you know, work product, right? So I think that's the added benefit. I mean, would you agree, Professor Choi? Yeah, and you could just work on more matters. It could be that every matter could be much faster, and then you could, um, like I was saying earlier, things could become economically viable to take on that were not economically viable before when it would have taken a large amount of time to do the research. Um, I actually, I, I agree with Ben, and I actually think this might be one of the reasons why, for example, partner billable rates have increased so much in tandem with the advent of, say, e-discovery, where the business model, where you have a lot of leverage and you attribute a lot of the billables to the work of associates has kind of gone away. Well, you still need to charge for the value you deliver. How do you do that? You charge it more directly than you used to. So let's imagine in uh, 10 years, uh, AI turns out not to have had any effect on our industry at all, tax or accounting. Best guesses, why, why, why do we think that happened? 
So one concern when I talk to people about generative AI is becoming like the attorney in New York who cited fake cases. And uh, one thing could be that you know, or new technology is rolled out, people hear bad things about it, and then they say, oh, I mean, I don't want to be getting um, you know, a product with hallucinations, and so distrust is built, and then you know, perhaps that, like, the, even if the problem of hallucinations were, is able to be solved in generative AI, that then um, you know, just no one is willing to take a second chance and, and go forward with that. Yeah, I also think that the regulatory and ethical environment will play a large role in the extent to which people adopt these. Um, and, you know, there'll be variation from state to state. You could imagine that it could become part of our ethical framework that you need to use these tools or else you're wasting time and you're wasting client money. Um, some people have suggested that some states' ethics rules already point in this direction. I'm not sure. But there have been intimations that we should expand the scope of ethics rules to encourage the use of AI. On the flip side, the more advanced these tools become, the more they encounter unauthorized practice of law, corporate practice of law kinds of issues. You've heard of tools like do not pay that try and entirely replace lawyers. Um, even if those tools worked, which they do not, mm -hmm. even if those tools worked, there would be um, bar, you know, ABA issues with attempting to use those and make those publicly commercially available. I'm going to revisit that, but I wanted to get Ben's take on this. I just find it so hard to imagine, like us in this room in 2034, saying, you know, this was a big nothing burger and <laughs> nothing happened. Like, I, so I'm like, I'm still, I'm stuck at like trying to engage. Like, I'm pretty imaginative and pretty creative. I'm really just struggling with the premise, Travis. I, I don't think it's going to happen. No, yeah. I don't know either. I, I admit defeat on this question. <laughs> I want to go back to something you said, Professor Choi, about the ABA. Do you think? with the development of AI and generative AI. I mean, the ABA, big ABA's take now is that their professional rules of responsibility and notices around technology cover the particular issues uh, that generative AI might pose. I disagree. I'd love your take on whether or not we need to adopt new professional responsibility rules around generative AI. Oh, that's really interesting. I. I honestly should not comment because I don't know enough about this area. Okay. I'm curious to hear what you think. Oh, I think that we, we have to specifically because I think generative AI, the difference is creation, right, specifically. And so I, I, I don't think that the mm. current technology guidelines at the ABA cover that. And uh, the ABA has an AI task force right now that's exploring uh, these issues along with the professional responsibility group there. but. Um, I don't know, Caitlin, what do you think? Right, that's a good point because, you know, when we're talking about these ethical rules as applied to AI, many of them are about you know, relying on um, you know, factual statements that others have made, relying on um, your, your subordinate employees. Well, if generative AI is creating things, um, you know, how do we fit that in with the existing paradigms? Should there be a, a separate category of how to treat that? So you're saying that supervisory attorneys and accountants should start to develop a new language that they could speak with younger associates uh, and younger lawyers uh, about how they created their work product? I mean, what do you think? Yeah, no, I think that's a good idea because, you know, the older attorneys are used to doing things their way, but you know the younger attorneys are going to be coming up with these technologies. People are using ChatGPT more and more, or, or generative AI platforms, and there will be the question of, I mean, you did this research or you wrote this brief, you have these cases. What were the ways in which you came about getting the, these sites, and um, has everything been verified, and, and you know, what was the process in using generative AI? What do you think, Ben? I think it's it's um, like how's Canada looking at this? Well, I, I'll speak for I'll speak for all of Canada, uh, and, and I will tell you that we in Canada have this all figured out. Um, <laughs> uh, figured out. Uh, you know, in some ways, I, my one of my reactions, um, speaking personally and not on behalf of all of Canadians, is that. Um, this is kind of like, in some ways, the law of the horse, right? Like, do we really need, you, you, you know, you have a duty um, to, you have duties to your client, you have duties to uh, the court, uh, 
you know, if you're going to be submitting a brief, you're signing your name on the brief, you're kind of vouching for the contents of the brief as you're submitting it. Do we really need like special generative AI rules to say, oh, well, like this sentence was generated by a generative AI solution, this one, like you're already signing off on the veracity of your submission. I don't think that's gonna change. We still want attorneys to take responsibility for what they're submitting to the, so part of it is we've already got this armory of rules and, and like the, a lot of good rules there. Um, so that's one line of thinking in my mind. Another part of thinking in my mind is, of course things are different and um, it's not just about, you know, creating some work product and then you know, going through and laboriously checking all the cases, there are gonna be systems, there are already systems uh, that are being developed that will automatically kind of go through a particular work product and allow you to um, check, it, has anything in this brief been superseded? Is there any obsolete law? Or like, are there things that, you know, are questionable in this brief? Um, and so, you turn generative AI on a generative AI work product and you're, and you're double checking it that way to satisfy yourself. And again, the reference point is, if you're gonna be signing off on this, putting your professional imprimatur on it, say this is my work product, I'm signing off on it, submitting it to a court. Um, like I, I think that does a lot of work for us uh, in this space. Now, I'm also, um, I'm also partly persuaded, at least partly persuaded by this idea that you know, the way to be a competent professional is to leverage a lot of this new tooling because you can actually reduce the probability of making mistakes. Um, if you do things the old fashioned way, um, it actually becomes more difficult to produce um, a, a very top tier work product. So we should be encouraging the use of a lot of these technological tools, but not uncritically, right? Um, we need to be doing so carefully and thoughtfully. So my first boss uh, in the tax world, Marty Shanebaum, used to say, uh, when I was writing a brief or a memo, right? Did you run it through the magic box, right? And he meant the computer, right? Uh, are you saying that you know supervisors can simply say that, or should they have a, some type of basis and knowledge about what the magic box is? Well, I, yeah, I think this is a. Of course, I have to say yeah, that they should have some understanding of how these things work, but. Um, you know, it's how much you need to know. Like, I, I mean, we, we use, all of us use electricity every day. We like use the light switches, you know, how much you really know about how your iPhone operates or, you know, your email client or like, could you like, let's suppose a refrigerator no longer was an invention. Would you be able to recreate how a refrigerator operates? You use one every day. Um, I don't know, like we need to be, we need to be conversant en enough to use the technology responsibly. Um, do we need to, teach coding to law students? Do we, like, I don't know how much you really need to know to be um, a competent user of a lot of the technology. So maybe I'll just leave it at that. I wanna go back, we have a couple more minutes. And I, <laughs> oh. oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you there. Okay. <laughs> We've got a couple more minutes, go we ahead, do. and then we'll see if we have, there are any questions in the audience. But keep okay, going. yeah, well I just wanted to go back to the original premise about, you know, are we at a revolutionary point in the practice of tax law uh, at accounting firms and law firms because of where technology is heading. Professor Choi? Hmm. Is this a paradigm shift? I guess it depends on your threshold for paradigm shifts. Um, I, I think, you know, Lexis, Westlaw, if those are paradigm shifts, this certainly is. I think this is probably the biggest innovation and the biggest change in how legal practice has been conducted for the past 150 years or so, at least. Um, and it'll only accelerate from here. The kinds of changes we've seen, there's no reason to believe that companies will stop coming out with better models and that companies like Blue Jay will stop coming out with better ways to use the better models, specifically in the legal context. So I think we have a huge change on our hands. There's no reason to believe we're out of a job, but there's plenty of reason to believe that we need to adapt to the tools, to apply them to our practice, to understand how they work to some extent in order to keep up. Caitlin, what do you think? Yeah, I, mean, I think the fact that we have these tools that can now uh, write, create, summarize, um, go through large amounts of data that can help us you know, so much more quickly than you know, how we've been doing things uh, currently, I, I think that will be a huge change going forward. 
Ben? I think every given year it's going to feel relatively gradual. Like there'll be measurable increases from year to year, but I think over the course of the next decade um, and, and beyond, we're going to see something that, you know, in retrospect, we all will acknowledge is, is a paradigm shift. Well, we'd like to open it up for questions. Do we have any questions from the audience? It's hard to see. We have one over one here. One over here. Yeah, so this is a good question. The problem is, I don't know which ones were, uh, and the counterfactual would have been that it, there would have been 10 to 15% at the bottom. And we said, I'm really confident that these are not good papers. But then they, they kind of blended in with the, the, the bulk of the papers, right? The majority of the papers at the end of the semester. So I don't know which ones were, you know, students assiduously creating their, their level best work product and just happened to kind of be the medium work product in the class. And, and which of those papers are the 10 to 15% that otherwise would have been at the bottom of the class? I, I like to think, I don't know for sure, but I like to think that it's because um, it allowed students to explore the idea space for their paper much more quickly. You know, I, I'll speak for myself. I feel really confident that the kinds of language that ChatGPT produced, at least like last April, when my students would have been working on their paper, like I would read that and I would go, it, unless they edited it quite heavily, I'd be like, that's a chat GPT answer. I didn't, I didn't detect that um, in the papers in my class. So students were doing a, a much more work. It probably allowed them to produce an outline very quickly. It probably allowed them to block out, you know, draft sections of the paper. But then they, they reworked it and worked it into a, a format that wasn't screaming to my eyes this is a chat GPT paper. So I didn't see that in, in the set of papers um, that students submitted. Now, there are all kinds of different writing tools. It's not just chat GPT. They could have been using some of the dozens of other um, writing aids that are based on generative AI technology that are available. I'm not confident that I know exactly what the writing looks like, what, what the, the, the feel of that text is coming out of those other systems. But um, I think they're using them as writing aids, writing tools uh, that allow them to produce their own work product um, or work with the system um, symbiotically to produce a, a better work product much more quickly than they would have um, produced that in the past. And so that's a long way of saying I don't know. <laughs> and, and when Ben said that, um, it, it brought to mind the idea that ChatGPT, generative AI, is a great equalizer that it's a tool that will make things more accessible so that you know, those at the bottom, who, the people who would have fewer resources, are able to use these tools that can help them more easily. A question here. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Mr. Troy. I published a couple studies that have followed a similar structure to Ben's. And we, we had students complete an exam and the, either with or without the assistance of AI. And you can track the performance increase of the specific students. And then we found exactly what Caitlin just said, that the students at the bottom of the class rose significantly more. And the students at the top of the class actually didn't improve at all. And in some, case, in some cases may have done worse with access to AI. Um, so it is a great equalizer. Um, in part, you could imagine that's because the AI itself, with minimal prompting and no substantial human intervention, can perform in our tests at or slightly above the median for the class. So even if you just have the AI produce its uh, exam results, and then don't edit it at all, you can get to the median. That is almost a floor on your performance, and then it can only get better from there. So for statistical reasons, you can imagine why that would have a flattening effect, because the people at the top are still at the top, the people at the bottom are now at the median. A question here. No. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, I have more of a comment than a question, so I apologize. <laughs> but I. I I, I, throughout my career, I felt like there are these moments when we're delusional as a profession. Like we're so out of sync with what is going on that we have discussions that, to me, just you know. And 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 so you know, having you know, this is new for everybody. 
Um, but having seen it, having used it, having played with it, there is no way that I would ever want to go back to law practice and not have a generative AI tool. Not necessarily ChatGPT, but something like BlueJay or CoCounsel that's built on a legal database that can pull from it and, you know, as you all have said, is, is becoming better. You know, I think of all those years in practice when I'm staring at the blank page because I know I have to do this research project. I know some pieces around it, but I can't, like, in my mind, you know, I've methodically thought through it, but where do I start in explaining this to a partner or to, um, you know, a colleague or a client? And how long those research projects took me when with, with these tools, it'll, pr it'll create something pretty amazing that I can then make my own and it would be so much faster. And it is the diff it, it is just like when I was in law school and we had to do the physical research of running around the library and then we got to try Lexis and Westlaw. And Lexis and Westlaw at the time were terrible. Like, I hated using them, truthfully. I preferred the physical because of all the connectors you had to use. It wasn't, it wasn't intuitive. Right now, you use them, and I'm sorry if anybody here is from Lexis or Westlaw, but it pulls up like 20,000 cases, and it's not accurate, and for tax, it's not great. And, you know, there's other tools that are better. Bloomberg came out with the Google type of search engine, and that was amazing. So it's like, and now that everybody has that. But, but I think going back to the chat GPT, as a professor, at, at our school we kind of did a, a, a focus group with students. And some of what we learned, which is why I think we're delusional, is they're already using chat GPT, almost all of them. Not only are they using it, but they are programming with it. So they're taking like all the cases for a class, creating a bot that would create a, you know, some, a, something that they could study from, and, uh, and so their outlines, their course outlines are being created by ChatGPT using a bot that they use, that they created. Like, these guys are programming, okay? Mm. <laughs> so you're gonna have people in your firms that have graduated from law school, taken the bar, and are programming using ChatGPT or some other thing. You're gonna have people that already know how to use this technology. We're not going back, ever. To, some, to not right. using it. Right. So, so it's, it's, it is about how do we use it, how do we think about the product that it is creating, and how do we tweak it and making, make it something really good. Um, you know, if you've seen like the demos of using it for depositions and anticipating deposition questions, and there's yeah. so much that it could do, it, it, makes, it could make us much better lawyers, much quicker lawyers. And the only thing I keep thinking about, you know, the next question is always, are we going to be out of practice? But, you know, in, in estate planning, trusts used to be 10 pages and they were typed and you had the copy that you ripped off. And then we had computers and now trusts are 100 pages and I think they're better. <laughs> but, but computers revolutionized the whole estate right. planning world and made it more accessible to so many people. Right. And, and I think that this, that's what this will do. It, and it, it increased our workload tremendously and the need for us, just like in the accounting. So right. I, I think I agree with everything that you've all said. I just think that it's here and we've just got to be, you, people who haven't tried it need to try it. You need to use it. You need to put a client letter in and see if it can make it better. You need to put some research in and uh, but don't use chat GPT for legal research. Use right. Blue Jay or something so, like that. I think she's so, on team paradigm shift. Right. <laughs> so I have, I, have, I have one question following up on that. Are you all aware or sensing that judges are starting to use uh, artificial intelligence and LLMs? Absolutely. We did not get to that, but there are a number of jurisdictions now that are requiring lawyers to submit affidavits before they submit anything to the court that says along the lines that if if you s are submitting this court submission, you if you use generative AI, then you at least that tested all of the the product using normal or right. traditional That's legal not my question. research. No. My yeah. question is whether judges sitting in their chambers, getting a brief from the IRS yeah. counsel lawyer and a brief yeah. from the taxpayer may, with the lights off, and they're by themselves, start tinkering <laughs> with, with AI to figure out what the right answer is in a, in a tax case. Uh, 
so there have been stories in other countries of judges openly saying that they're using it yeah. to write opinions. Mm -hmm. um, there have been some judges in the United States that have been caught uh, using it. Um, so the answer is uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all very much. That was a fabulous thank panel you, discussion. I want to thank. I want to thank, thank everybody for being here. Thank so thank thanks to our members. Great. Thanks to our staff. We will be together again in May at, at the Marriott Marquis on May 2nd. Yeah, thank you. Hope everybody has a good afternoon and a safe trip home. Thank you all.